Hello, Dream Team. Welcome along to Season 3, Episode 5 of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby. I hope you've had a good weekend. I hope you are having a good week. It's lovely to be with you. Haskin Tinsar here, Rugby's answer to PG and Duncan. Hail and Pace, I thought. Hail and Pace. Bonnie and Clyde. reference, though, for some people that probably wouldn't get that. Um, how are you both? Good weekends? Lovely weekend. Quite heavy weekends, all three. Yeah. How was it your birthday weekend? Uh, yeah, Friday was very good. Um, opening day of Cheltenham, so went racing. Um, Any win. joy? Actually, no joy whatsoever. I didn't win or won a single race, which right. was fantastic. Uh, I went with uh, Azara Works for the Jockey Club. Well, sure what the correct term is, is on the committee. Right. Um, so he went in, uh, she was there in official capacity. I went with Beastie. <laughs> in a very unofficial capacity. <laughs> uh, There's nothing official about that Beastie That is the ever. sidecar Spent a lot of time with Ben did, Wallace, actually. Did you? MP? Yeah. He used to be, I was at Edinburgh, he was always milling around in Edinburgh when I was a yeah, Stoudon. From a, to, the, no, to the side at Pennines, isn't he? He's up, uh, he's Preston North End. Yeah. Did you get the inside scoop on what's happening? Possibly, but it's quite chilling and let's not talk about it. Really? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's removed himself from, from being a candidate, hasn't he? Yes. Um, so yeah. I've removed. It's a bit like I've removed myself from being a candidate. No one ever thought I was going to be a candidate. But actually, I well, this, no, is I mean, time, this is the time oh, where no one yeah. wants the job. Yes. I would hundred percent take it right now. Oh yes, yeah, so such it a couldn't get much worse. That's what I mean. It? Yeah. it couldn't get much worse. You might as well blow the whole thing up. Yeah. But, you, but <laughs> do also, you think you'd survive longer than forty-four days as prime minister? Well, I've already got previous. I've already got scandal. I've already upset a load of All people. Baked in. Already, that's None inherent. Of yours is in, hidden. No, so it's hidden. Good, though. Yeah, it's inherent into it. I mean, I definitely charge double expenses. I have no, no qualms about it. I also you'd, you'd be wallpapering the got, whole of Downing Street, yes. not just the top floor flat. You've only got to make twenty days. You get your hundred and fifteen grand for life. Oh, that is. I mean, I can <laughs> do that. Told not to take that, isn't she? Yeah, I'm well, sure she told a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but don't worry about it. I, I think it is a bit of an odd one, really, because it, it kind of, it is. We're almost turning into Italian politics, like Berlusconi esque kind of things, isn't it? Like is he your idol. Well, I bunga just, bunga. The bunga, <laughs> but I just. It is, it's got the air of that, isn't it? It's just like, oh, we did parties. Don't worry about it. We'll just ignore it. You've been fined. You're out of office. I'd like to come back into office. You can't come back into office. We don't like you. I just, it's insane. But then I thought, um, what's really interesting, is if you look at it from both sides, quickly, they, a lot of Labour people talk about, you know, wish we need someone more relatable. They're, they're ballsing the whole thing up. Nobody in that House of Commons, bar probably a couple, is relatable. Nobody. You know, everyone goes, we need to talk about struggle. We need to talk about life. What are you talking about? Nobody. Have you ever met any of the people that go in there? They're just so removed. So, yeah. I reckon Mari Black in, in the SNP. Have you ever listened to her? No. Gosh, yeah, I'll tell you what, she's a hell of an orator. Really? I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily naturally align with the SNP, <laughs> but I, she is about the most she impressive she, orator <laughs> really in the chamber. But I mean, look, it's just mad. I, I think it's, it's all just going to fall apart again. Yep. Um, and round and round. But I think it's indicative of the way the world is going at the moment. And it's kind of this block of history when we come back to tell our children when they learn about it, we'll be like, what the hell happened in those five <laughs> what years? What were you doing? Were you doing? Global <laughs> pandemic, scandal upon scandal, three prime ministers, one lasted less than ho however many days. 44 days, yeah. Uh, we've got no money, everything's falling apart, global warming, we've got extinction rebellion, uh, people gluing themselves to the roads. We got It's just gone completely and yeah. utterly insane. And actually, weather fronts are destroying the world. I don't, I don't really know what's going on. Yay. <laughs> Welcome to the good, the bad, and the politics. Anyway, getting back, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, getting back to it. No, it was a really good session. Yeah. On Friday. I'll, tell you, I I'll also just drink on yeah. and go hard. That's what yeah. I did Friday. I mean, you, you know, do? it's bad when the bouncer's giving you water, like coming oh, over really? and going, oh, mate, probably just need to have one of them. I was like, really? Really? Um, Can you imagine being a bouncer, though, with him out of control? You you know that you're going to have some quite hard work. But to I keep wasn't you... actually quite, I'm, ne I'm never out of control. No, you're though. a lover, not a fighter. No, I just don't ever really, I sort of, my curse is I remember everything. Um, I will say this next day was a bit of a, 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 a schlap. I had agreed to meet my parents um, with, with Bodie and Chloe. Chloe pulled the pin and was like, I was too hungover to come. So I then had Bodie. It was my first trip out with her, just on my own. So obviously um, I got a car there, thought it was probably the best way of doing it. And it was going so swimmingly. I was looking after, I felt terrible. I was like sweating at the table, talking to my parents. <laughs> and then halfway through, I looked at her and I was like, something doesn't smell quite right. This is, this is- Is that me or her? Yeah, well, it could have been like, all my parents. You know, they're all getting on in age. Um, and I looked at her and I was like, right, this isn't right. And I thought, do you know what? I'm just probably going to change them. I'm going to change her. So I was walking through, everyone's smiling at me. Took her obviously- there's no changing facilities ever in men's toilets, are there? Just it's, they talk about reverse sexism. What happens if I was a single dad? Yeah. But anyway, found the disabled toilet with the changing table. Obviously, unwrapped this beautiful little present to discover that she had absolutely shit all over herself, right? And imagine I'm locked in a hot, a hot room. 
up the back, limited mobility, right? Trying, and she's just laughing at me the whole time, like, smiling at me, going, fuck, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Obviously, destroyed her clothes. Could, didn't have any replacement clothes apart from a oh, pink bear suit that was in the main place. I had to walk through a screaming baby, but I managed to man. Did you not sort like, out. Sort of like mummify her just in Lou Rock? I did. No, I, I, no, I cleaned her, cleaned her perfectly, changed her, then wrapped her in a, in a muzzy, took her back out. My mum helped me put the uh, pink bear suit on. So then it, it was fine. Mums are always there. Mums yeah. are great. But then the next day on a Sunday, went for a pub lunch. And I said, oh, do you know what? I'll change it. Went into the men's toilet. Again, there's no change facility. Yeah. So I had to change it on the top of a toilet seat with um, with, uh, with a changing so mat. Dirtier at no, the end no, of it. no, no. I put a changing mat on the top of it. But obviously, she's quite long. So like head's flopping off the back, trying to do it. I'm sweating. Even limit, more limited mobility. So uh, can I just make a call? Men like to change children too. Not like Jacob Rees-Mogg, you know, doesn't want to do fuck all. We need some changing facilities that are... We do. The campaign you... starts here. Yeah. Who'd have thought Hask would be the front and centrepiece for... Improved facilities for dads. It has been something that's bugged me yeah. for a long time. It's has awful. It? Why? I mean, what was if you want to do? I just don't understand how you, why Unless they don't do it. There's a disabled toilet that you can go in. Like, uh, you know, you can't. But Matt, change it. Honestly, the, the height ratio of me bend over the bare <laughs> back to operate, then on my knees with limited knee mobility in a tight, confined space yeah. with piss on the floor. Remember, like 90% you... of blokes haven't got these issues that <laughs> no, you have. No, no, it's fine. Um, I can remember coming back on a long haul flight once when my daughter was a toddler and we put the back left loo out of action about 15 minutes into the flight with a scenario similar really? to that. Yeah, the whole thing, lockdown, tape, the whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> Had to move people but forwards it, in the rows. Oh, yeah. It was sort of... But it, it, it is weird, isn't it, where you just look at them, you're like, how did you... But how did it even happen? Biologically, how did it get everywhere? Where yeah. was the warning? Yeah. Never mind. Should have read the T's and C's before <laughs> I did, getting involved. I did. <laughs> um, as you'll have noticed, it's the three of us back together. We had some fairly high-profile guests, but I think we've been fermenting for one of these yeah, yeah. just put the world to right sessions for a bit. Just before we get into some of the bits and bobs I've got on my clipboard this week how much fun was thursday uh, thursday we was doing? a lot of fun uh yeah we were up at aylesbury rugby club um with the rfu for uh, play together stay together and um we we put f together two teams hesk <laughs> rfc versus tins rfc um and no, it was a lot of fun we got banners up there uh, matt banahan came down phil vickery who is in uh, Unbelievable, yeah, Nick. In, in great Nick. So I saw him on GMB. I think that. Uh, no, he was on some. Uh, no, he was on BT Sport doing. He was on after the day after. He, he looked well. He wasn't in any. Didn't look like he was incredible. Give him a uh, shuffle. Mirzy was, was up there. Uh, who else was up there? Tom Wood. Tom, Tom, Wood. Tom, Wood. Tom Wood played well. Actually, so did Delo. So, uh, yeah, we we practice the game on rules so uh, if any local rugby clubs haven't seen the footage just so you can get games done with less yep. than 15 players on the pitch and, and still have a bit of crack you can uh, deviate the times didn't we we only did 60 minutes each way yeah. 12 players on each 60 time. minutes each way Jesus oh, 60 minutes, sorry 60 minutes in total <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it felt like 60 minutes each way definitely wouldn't have survived and was Gino from Mensch alright he got a bit of a yeah he's alright a bit of clarity he's really happy with it good I, battle school I, I was um, came like some 1980s rocker didn't he with yeah. his ACDC t-shirt on in leather yeah I love that I'm much more of a, a a coach. I was much more of a coach management mm. role than anything else. Could always and, see that in the way you played the game. That, that you were going to be a natural kind of you. overseer. Thank you. And I I remember. I mean, there's a real moment where I questioned my sort of ability to communicate to my players. And I went, v "Vickery, Vix, Vix, we're changing. Come off." And he just stopped, stared at me, mouthed fuck off <laughs> in the middle of the game and just refused to come off yeah. and then ironically missed the tackle to let Tyndall score to draw the game so I debriefed afterwards and I've sent him <laughs> a few videos a, a few analysis notes he hasn't replied um, but he was very he, he was actually very good I'll tell you who was brilliant Bat Banahan yeah. yeah you know he just retired because he got bored yeah I asked him why did you retire he just went why? They went, apparently I don't know if I'm allowed to say this but fuck it I'm going to do it anyway um, coaches went to him like what's your plans for this season like what goals and he went retire they're like what and he went, just retire <laughs> he went, why? I just don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. Just went through, played the season. He goes, I'll do everything you want me to do and then just quit. But yeah. his body's absolutely fine. But the way he played, yeah. it's unbelievable. 130 he, kegs for a winger. Yeah. Well. He looked mighty. He's now playing quite good golf, isn't he? Is he? Scratch golfer. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. Because it's weird because you, you normally, I mean, I only put it in my lane, you, you, you sort of associate someone that big with not a lot of skill. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. I, it's well, sort of my my association with it, but actually turns out he's actually pretty good at everything, isn't he? He's big, he's heavy, and he's long. What was quite funny was we had a nice little presentation afterwards, didn't we? Awards given out for well, we were going to call it One Foot in the Grave Award, but we had to rebrand yeah. it into Longevity in the Sport. <laughs> I think it was it's classic work of the yeah, review. Yeah, yeah. We came up with a whole load of amazing names: yeah. Dumper of the Day, yeah. Um, yeah. Darb of the Day. Yeah, no, we're all sort of just yeah points of prize, but they cut the feed before that which i didn't realize when we were because i thought we were live on rfu.com and then you got yeah. given the mic 
can't be trusted. That they wasn't live. They literally God. just no, pulled the plug. Yeah, it wasn't. I, I checked Thankfully. it. <laughs> They've given the mic to Hask. Panic! Go, Death go, 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 go. Shut down. down. Right, so the three of us are back together today. We'll get into the current state of the club game, how England is shaping up ahead of the autumn. We'll look at how the Scots are coming together as well. Their autumn campaign actually kicks off against Australia at Murrayfield this Saturday. And we'll discuss the Women's World Cup in Aotearoa with the quarterfinals this weekend featuring both England and Wales. And if that wasn't enough, we'll have Mike's moment of the week and bin juice, which Hask will explain all about. Shall we start with England first of all, though? Um, Kel surprise. Eddie Jones is looking to reduce the amount of training that his players are doing after sharing information with the NFL team, the Green Bay Packers. We will have a little bit on that in just a moment or two. Before that, though, a few injury problems ahead of the Autumn Nation series, which starts in under a fortnight with Argentina at Twickenham. Might we see a new captain, Courtney Laws and Owen Farrell, both struggling with symptoms of concussion. Owen Farrell, unfortunately, knocked unconscious against Exeter the weekend, as Sarri's one last gasp there. Uh, they are not going to the Jersey training camp because of those symptoms. Have you checked in with Courts recently? Is he all right? I haven't, actually. I think I had a dream about him the other day. Right. Chloe dreams about him all the time. No, um, <laughs> I, I suppose no, that's checking in in some capacity. No, actually, but, was, I was asking about it because obviously he's on 97 caps. Yeah. So should, in this autumn, all, all going well, should get his 100th cap. And I was just thinking, I was there when he was sort of eight, first 18, I think, 18 when he turned up on that tour to New Zealand, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Was it New Zealand or was it Australia? I can't. I thought it was New Zealand 2000. 08. Yeah, 08, I thought. I thought it was. We'll figure out whether it was 08 or no. Yeah, but he... Um, really good. That what, is an unbelievable innings. innings but it? also the way he plays the game yeah. as well, like um, Mab. But no, I think... I mean, he he's obviously been... We sort of, we've sort we given it a bit of exposure, but obviously him captaining them as well when Owen hasn't been there. Yeah. Meg, that's been mega, and he's been doing such a well, good job. Well, he's now captain outright. Yeah. In, in, and obviously that was in the, in, in the Australia tour. There was a... Owen had a... I think wasn't hugely happy about it, but I think Eddie Jones feels that the way Courtney and his relaxed yeah. nature, the way he speaks to the referees, is beneficial. Owen needs to focus on the fight. Really? Which is what, yeah. Has that been officially announced? I think so. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. But then, but both if they, utterly, totally invaluable yeah. to the team, but they perform but different roles. Different, yeah. But if yeah. both um, Owen if both internal, Courtney external, if both aren't in, then Ellis will probably take over, won't he? What do we? What would we make of that? I think it'd be amazing. We called it. We did two years ago. And when we start, you know, raise their eyebrows at us and sort of laughs and pokes fun, but actually we, we pretty much get it right most of the time. Yeah, I, th I think. Well, all you guys go do, yeah. right, you know. Although I'm half. I get it right sixty percent of the time. Every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would we? Would, what would Ellis give England as skipper? I think. I think it's what we've talked about for the last two years, and the fact that how he's evolved and how he constantly keeps evolving into just being a better a human being, a better rugby player. I mean, he's just getting, but he just keeps improving in terms of what he delivers on the pitch. And then within that, I think he's very, you know, what we've talked about, very approachable for young players, which obviously the squad is full, filled with at the moment. Um, keeps people honest as well. He, he's quite happy to give you that stare and tell you exactly what it feels without any humour behind it, even though there might even still be some humour behind it, but he hides it very well. And um, I think Eddie likes that. I think he, he feels that's sort of Eddie's, bit of Eddie's personality. So a couple of sort of headlines about this England squad at the moment. Luke Count Dickey struggling with a knee problem. Jamie George struggling with a foot injury. Lewis Ludlam has got a hip issue. We've mentioned Courtney and his concussion. Owen Farrell touch and go probably off the back of the incident in the Exeter game. Johnny May has dislocated his shoulder, but sales Tom Roebuck's been called up. Put all that into the pot. What, what is par for England this November? I still think uh, I still think there's enough exciting players in there, but it's performances for me. I just don't feel that in the Six Nations we've created enough. Now, obviously, we still got the job done in the summer, um, but I want to see a consistency in our attack and creating opportunities. Um, whereas we know how consistent our defence is in terms of the energy it brings and the opportunities it gives. But I just feel that we that creativity that we were always hoping for Marcus Smith to deliver week in week out hasn't been there. You know, even at the weekend, Marcus. Smith scored a fantastic try and I think he scored 24 points, but then there was a lot of just ill-timed chip kicks and bits and pieces. Uh, so we need to find a bit more consistency around that. Uh, and if we can do that with the performances, we'll get we'll get victories because we, as I say, we think we've got smart decision makers on the field that where we'll we'll still build scores and we'll. But we need to be creating opportunities, and that was what was lacking for me. Do you think that's enforcing it a bit? trying to do because with with harlequins they, they do play quite loose it does create stuff is that him just got he's got so much freedom he's just forcing it a little bit or is it or is it you know yeah i mean i think if you look through the england games uh he, he he isn't as 
pivotal as he is in Harlequin's yeah. games. Now, is that his active choice to sort of sit back and let other playmakers come into the game around him, or is that a conscious role that is being asked of him? Um, you know, so I don't know. With Farrell having that sort of uh, with his concussion, whether he's going to get back in time. Does that then give him that ownership of confidence where he'll be at 10 again and who, what do you do with your centres? I mean, you look around now and you think two people have sort of marching, one of them who's playing, I, I don't know what he's done to Eddie Jones, but he's playing pretty well all the time. Then if you look at someone like Ollie Lawrence as well, who has landed at Bath and had two exceptional games. I mean, he's, you know, he's aggressive and everything. Else. I know that Manu's back. Um, it's how we get the best and out of that balance. So the question I want to ask you is, there is some unbelievable rugby being played in the Premiership at the moment, Helter Skelter. It's some very, very exciting games on a weekly basis. The question that has always been asked is how how representative, I suppose, is is what we're seeing domestically to the international game. Europe has always been the bridge. We obviously haven't been able to judge Premiership sides in Europe yet this season. My gut, and this is a point for you to react or, or agree with, is that what we're seeing in the Premiership has gone further away from what you get on an international weekend than we've had in previous years. Is that is that true? Do you um, or do you no, think I what th- we're seeing in the Prem is perfect preparation? I, th- I think what you're saying is true, but then I think with sort of the Six Nations, everyone sort of goes, "Oh, it's weather," so it goes back to attritional. I don't think it needs to be. I think the boys show. The Premiership shows, the top 14 shows that you can play offloading rugby in whatever conditions you choose to play. And it's just about a mindset of how you do it. Um, yes, Test Match rugby is all about winning, whereas sometimes you get a little bit of leniency around, you know, with playoffs in, in the Premiership, you you don't normally, ha- you don't have to win every game. You still want to try and play a brand where the, where the players are enjoying it. But I think if you want the players to enjoy international rugby, they've got to be, yes, playing to win, but they've got to be playing a brand that they like. So, so do you think Eddie Jones is happy with what he's seen in the Premiership relative to what he wants from his team this November? Or do you think he's... No. Do you not? I don't know. I, I don't... Uh, look, I mean, again, I haven't been there for, for a long time. I just know that a lot of times when players go back to the, the Premiership clubs and, the, you know, the ball in play time, and again, I, I haven't got the, the, the stats in front of me to tell you, but, you know, speed of game, ball in play time, um, the, the, the level of fitness, uh, conditioning, even simple things like getting off the floor and the intensity and the continued intensity. In fact, sometimes the Premiership games, you can hide a little bit and the score lines are massive. We're seeing more try score than ever. You know, international rugby, yes, try, I think try scoring has gone up, but it's, 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 you know, there isn't that space and time and you're going to require to work a lot harder. And I think that it's a little bit frustrating because sometimes it's a bit misleading and I don't think he feels that... The players are often where they need to be. Um, I think. I think in terms of players' confidence um, and the fact that they show they've got the skills to be able to do it, I think that's great. I think it's. I just. I just find international rugby very different. Yeah, um, sure. And I. And I, I. don't think it's ideal preparation because when you switch into those, you know, those first autumn international games, it's. It's. You know, the intensity goes up. The lack of space goes up. The. You know. The. The. Just the pressure. The pressure, but also, if you imagine, there's such a varying degree of talent in those Premiership, ga- in those premiership games where most people at the international level are of a certain standard. And, you know, you're not going to get those easy those easy wins, those easy mistakes. Everyone's going to be as intense. You know, the fitness levels go up, requirements go up. So I, I don't think it's in a bad place. I, I, I would say that Eddie's never that comfortable. He almost, his frustration always has been is that when he gets the players for these Autumn International Six Nations, he spends the first kind of couple of weeks upskilling them back to the required level and required standards in training to meet the metrics that he expects that have that have been proven over time to show that a team is ready for international rugby because the first sessions are all over the you know can all mm. be all over the place boys meters how quickly they accelerate how quickly they get up on the ground how much distance they're covering you know the amount of work rate they're putting in and the standards they're expecting at things like line out set piece is he has to sort of unwind that a little bit and i think that's probably the same for all international teams but when the Premiership is quite self-serving and playing very different styles across the board and also different standards. That's what a lot of people forget and why, you know, when we talk about certain players that don't appear or certain players go in the squad and everyone's like, why are they not in there? The media and the fans. You don't see the videos on training. You don't see actually, do you know what, that for four phases, they're doing fuck all, which is fine in the Premiership. But international rugby, you and especially international sort of training preparation, you need to be there. Yeah. And more often than not, 
you know, it, I think Eddie as a coach could turn around and sit down with the media and go, right, the reason we don't pick so-and-so because he's had one good cameo. Maybe, I'm not, I'm, I used Arundel as an example last time we talked about this. This is not based on anything he's done. But there would have been a reason that he didn't, he didn't feature continuously. It's because there'll be something that he's doing positionally isn't quite right or doesn't work back. You know, we've talked about Alex Don Brandt, who I think is amazing. But there were concerns about whether his work rate, you know, Billy at times, you know, what was he doing in between those big runs? Because it's well and good doing that stuff, but where was he hiding? Was he getting off the floor? Was he having a defensive impact? Was he working back? Because with limited space, if you, if I do a carry and then I meander back, you know, England will always look at how quickly you reset. So if, yeah. I, if I carry, how quickly I get back in position, because then the defence see a different picture. They see me. And they're like, right, I've got to defend him as well. Whereas if you're meandering going on the floor, there's no threat there. And suddenly they've still got 14 players on their feet. It, it doesn't ever, ever affect the defence. So I'm not saying this was with Don Brandt's thing, but you, you, that's why a lot of these decisions are made. So I don't, I think it's in a good place, but I don't think it's amazing. I was hoping to see a bit more consistency in, in selection, but unfortunately he's getting, this is not going to be Eddie's, Eddie's fault for once. It, it's going to be, you know, he's just going to have to pick of what's available and then hope he gets them back later. But Do you not think as well with that though, you know, they play those people out of position and he always gets criticised for that and, and, and inconsistency in the side. You've got more players, though, who have had experience in international rugby yeah, now within yeah. that squad mm. and more players that have played out of position. So when you do have a couple of losses, you can actually still put a very, very good side out there together and, and, and rejig things so you get the players you want on the field, maybe not playing in the right position. And actually, it builds some resilience. So I don't think it's... it's an, you know, people always criticise, why are you doing this? He knows nothing. Why hasn't he picked those people? Why is he giving him a game? When you look at it now, if you lose Court and Laws, Owen Fowl, there's some good guys to, who, who can step in who've got experience. Uh, if you need, want to get certain players on the field and he rejigs the back line and suddenly you've got Freddie Stewart playing on the wing which everyone fucking lost their mind because you want to fit some other players in there that kind of I think is, is quite smart with international rugby because when you go into an autumn and a few players down you suddenly got guys who know what it's like know the intensity you've not got turning up for the first game wide eyed and terrified yeah yeah, I, I don't disagree into it, but I, I agree that's a reactionary thing so whereas at the moment Eddie's been doing it as a <laughs> yeah, yeah you're right as he's right. purpose picked it yeah. so you purposely pick your best fullback out of position, whatever. Um, which I do think go, going forward, especially a year out from a massive tournament where we're actually in a good side of the draw that we've got a, a chance to w really go far in the tournament because we've got good enough players, yet, but we're, we're not quite singing on form yet. But I, I do still think rugby is built around the week to week and having the similar a similar team it doesn't have to be the same team every week but similar people where you know who's the sort of best form and you can chase that and then there are changes within that but i think it's built from a spine that comes together that know each other you know mm. always i can talk about center partnerships all the time knowing what your center partner is going to do now can i say that any of the centers that are going into england know exactly what it's like because they've played with the, the guy next to you 30 times well they haven't and I do think that is still a big role in what makes a team a team, especially at rugby, is being able to predict what the guy inside and outside do. Know. So if Hask is defending inside me, I might know, I'll know what ha tackle Hask doesn't want to make. But then I can force a player back into his wheelhouse where he wants them because I know that's where he wants them. Or if I know I'm really panicked on the outside and I know Hask makes a great left shoulder low tackle as they try and take that gap in between me and him, I know I can leave that and I don't really have to worry about it. And I just feel that, uh, do we have that in that England team yet where people are that confident with the people that they're playing with? I might be wrong, but I'd, that'd be a question but to he, ask. It actually, we, we, I, I, look, Mike, I think Mike's spot on. I think one person actually said it really succinctly when we were doing the, the green room stuff in Italy. And I'd obviously been defending Eddie Jones about lots of different things. And I thought Lawrence, um, he put it quite, not well, very nicely, which I hadn't thought about, was obviously consistency in selection but consistency in coaching as well you know which is one of the things we, we just haven't seen you know lots of change has happened over those over those years that you kind of build a rapport with the players next to you, you build a rapport with the coaches you understand the expectations you sort of feel that um you know you feel that settled relationship and as a, i think we all hope now as we kick into that with that world cup sort of period as we as we head towards it that everything is now consistent because i think all the points are yeah solid. i'm not sure that's going to be the case oh, really? anthony Seabold, who's the defense coach is, is going back to the nrl after november so there'll be a new defense coach for the six nations and into the rugby world cup this is a sort of i mean we, we're touring in terms of the conversation i suppose the, the, the question to go back to is the gap between premiership and what england are trying to do how do you ensure 
that England are are going to be the in the right frame space, making the right selections, etc. Come the Six Nations, if what you're getting in the Premiership is not that relative to what Eddie Jones wants, does he have to move? what he's trying to do back towards what the, player, but the players it, in the Premiership are offering, or has he got to take the players from no, the Premiership but has and this put ever, them into his system? This, are you asking a question? Has that ever changed? Was that I a, think was the gap between d- the two has been much closer, uh, much closer in, in years gone by. I still think it's quite close when you go to um, European. Yeah, and you start but we haven't seen Premiership games. sides delivering in Europe, Saracens apart potentially, for several years. Yeah, and... I, I think the Premiership look, has fallen I, off relative to what Ireland... The Irish provinces and the top fourteen give you. Yeah, possibly you're correct because when when they put their teams together, you're playing two international teams. Yeah, which you're not obviously getting at the Premiership because there's more diversity and everything else. So um, possibly, but what you've got to try and do, and this goes back to in some ways consistency in the coaching, is you've got to have a plan of how you want them to play. Now, I would say that unfortunately that changes a lot from Eddie's point of view he, each sort of tournament he seems to have a different focus whether it's we're going to play at a speed that they can't cope with or we're going to play at a physicality that they can't live with or we'll go back ne- to England's traditional but it's never, front up front but it's never the same and now whether this is the, the, you know that's Eddie just you know throwing stuff out there and behind closed doors there is an exact well he said coming into this November that they want to play but without showing too much ahead of the World Cup next year I just don't get that because like that, I would say that about the England the Red Roses right now I'm getting less and less confident in the in the Red Roses, not because of how good they are, but it feels that they are holding things back. So then you're just giving well, now's away... now's got to be the time to go for it. Well, we said that in our show we did with we Elmer, did. didn't we? Yeah, we did. Like, what, why would you ever hold well, anything back? I just I do, don't understand that. Be, you know, I don't see France holding anything back. Just win every game, win playing well, and people will start worrying about, what, why was New Zealand so good? Why were they so good for so many years? It wasn't because they worried about what someone else yeah. was thinking. Constrain they were themselves. just going, well, we'll go win we'll, and you've got to come and play us at our game. And and half the time, most teams were, were defeated mentally before they even took on the field with the, with the All Blacks. And that's what... To say that you can hold things right, if you execute things, it doesn't matter if yeah. they've done the homework. I don't know if he... I don't know if he do you reckon he's... Oh, that's got all the hallmarks of him just like winding I, someone up. Yeah. yeah. I, I just... I feel like it's like he woke up and was like... Today I choose chaos. I yeah. just went fuck it. I'm going to make up something because I don't. I don't. I don't think he's ever held anything back. And also, when people talk about rugby in rugby terms, like what are you holding back? Like if you've got a guaranteed try scoring move off a line out that you've worked that works every single I time. I don't think there is. Such no, that's a thing. what I mean. Not anymore. But do you remember that? You know, in the art of the you know the front pill, back pill. Uh, you're going through the middle every now and then. Like with um, you'll catch someone out with one yeah. of those moves, and that could be a secret weapon. But I don't know what you would hold back. The game that he referenced in giving this explanation was when I think it was 2018 Sam Underhill had a try chalked off with the last play of the game yeah. Courtney was a millimetre offside but England went 15 nil up against the All Blacks New Zealand came back pipped it 16-15 but Eddie said on that day we learnt far more about them which helped us then win the World Cup semi-final yes. than they learnt about us so his reference point is that he's done this in well the those convenient notes <laughs> after the date don't they it was like Clive Woodward saying I'm dropping you for the quarter final uh, for the semi-final but I'm definitely going to bring you back in the final well I was if you lost then it would have about fired wouldn't it yeah um, but yeah like, he's always a great he yeah, but I mean yeah. he's not he's not he's not wrong I just don't think you know overplaying your you know I, I think back in the day you could have overplayed your hand and could have pulled stuff out I just think now the, the space the timing there's very rare like I said it, it would be a trick play it would be a backs move that you know is guaranteed to score it would be you know a type of almost a, a you know into play where you're going to say that we're going to offload a bit more or you know well, we, this time we, when, when we interviewed Sean Edwards you know he when every time we played was he used to make the um the the, the you know the nines or the fullbacks kick into the middle of the field so the ball never went out so never went out. So you could never clear your lines and they would have to clear it and they have to really test their fitness. Whereas maybe you would change the tactic, go, do you know what, we're going to kick out because we want them to have more set piece. We want more set piece. That would be a tweak that you would do that would profoundly affect things potentially. I, I suppose what I'm trying to get to is, are we, you know, there's so much chaos within English rugby at the moment. Do we think the national team is going to sort of steady the ship a little bit or is this national team at, in danger of being... Oh, it's, caught in the it's trap. hugely in danger of being, of being caught. I, I, you know, the way everything is hyped at the moment, I mean, if they lose one game or two, or two games, everyone's going to go mad. Yeah. You can already see it. You can already see it. I can't, I, you know. I, yeah, I, I mean, the end of the Six Nations, we're awful again. We win the, we win the summer tour with series. We're, we're all right again. Yeah. It's just, it's where, where it goes on the first 
first game. What is it going to take for England to get back and, and for the, the confidence levels to get back to where they were? Four out of four. Yeah. Just four out of four. Four out of four. Well, um, per- um, performance is in there. Okay. You can't scrape through it. I think if you look back at la- last autumn, the way they've, you know, character got them quite a good re- reports off the back of it, the way they came back in South Africa in a game that no one would have thought they would have come back and won. Yeah. They did come back and won. Everyone was like, wow, look, we've got some resilience, but then we need to focus on performance. So we went in to that Six Nations feeling confident. And then... Scotland. We, yeah. And then it's it's destroyed again. Um, so I, I think it's a, a combination of, of forwards, I think I think we've got players in form. I thought Marrow was outstanding on the weekend again, which you need. I think you he's need. back carrying to his best, isn't yeah, he? Well, yeah. like, I always with Marrow, you know, obviously he's, he's like disruptive work mm. and his work on the on the ground and and, and his, you know contact and, and winning those turnovers but i always question sometimes whether how how much he carried the ball yeah. he's now carrying way more looks like a different Fair threat to and, slade who hit him you see that tackle they put on him yeah. 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 it was horrible like yeah. running full pelt into full marrow, pelt. marrow yeah. steps back into him and he just wears it yeah but brought him down but i mean but that again for the, for the national team when you when you've got you, know, you look at the the you know, we don't want the starting lineup is, but you suddenly got options. Ellis is a carrier. Yeah. You've got Sinks as a carrier. You've got Marrow as a carrier. You've got Billy as a carrier. You've got Curry as a carrier. You suddenly got carriers all across the forwards. So again, it means you've got threats all over the place. Whereas in the past, you know, Courtney, Billy, and but you know, that's quite pedestrian. You 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 see them or Mac or Maca, you sort of line up and see them, and it's quite obvious with all those weapons and all those threats and also confidence in doing it. And I think that's what Mara's got now. He's got real confidence in his carrying ability. I think it's making a big difference. Okay. We shall see. Time will tell, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just want to quickly check in because actually Eddie Jones has some quite interesting things to say on player safety. And I am reading his quotes. Rugby, because of the nature of the sport, is a physical collision game. And we need to keep looking at how we make it safer, how we keep looking after the players better. We've been looking a little bit of the stuff in America. I was talking to NFL and NBA where the amount of training time is being cut. One of the things they do in the NBA is mime training where they're not allowed to talk. And we're going to have a go at doing that. It's the eye contact, being able to understand each other's body language. Every sport is being modified in the physical load you can do. In cricket, the fast bowlers don't bowl as much, do they? There is greater welfare care in every sport, so the amount of physical training you can do is being lessened. My God, I reckon the teams that you were involved in would have loved mime training rather oh. than your ability <laughs> to I just hold it. Shut Literally, up, Literally, that would be the end of a coach. Yeah. If you get into Jono, right, Jono, we're going to do some mime coaching. Get out. <laughs> yeah. You are. Get out. It's what, 2022, some... though, so let's give it a go. <laughs> I can see how it works in basketball because generally... You can see all your teammates in front of you and you yeah. can do a head nod. Yeah. When all of them are to your lefty, to your right, and you can't... And unfortunately, you're a predator, so you only look forward. But I, do, but, I do, do, but I do think, actually, in it, that if you think about it now, when it's like if you watch um, good tens and, and you know, or good sense or whatever, like, so they look in the whole time. I think it would be quite good for forwards to do that just because you, you get sort of... Because international rugby is essentially getting from A to B as quickly as possible. But you do you still get, do that. You, you do, but you a lot do of guys okay, don't do okay, as much as they should do. Occasionally, when, when they're looking, you're like, yeah. or if you're, if you're yeah. across on a cross field, yeah. you're, you're not shouting. Are players training, and you've spoken about this a number of times yeah. before, yeah. but this is becoming quite a prominent um, sort of topic in <laughs> the sport. Are Shock, they, it only takes everyone else to catch up, like, yeah. you know, 10 yeah. years later. What, so, okay, not are they training too much. What, it, what would be the ideal workload in a week? So I'd say you've got, uh, obviously, Saturday game, yeah. Sunday off. Monday, I would say, would just be a full recovery. I don't think you even need to go out and do anything. I think you just, you know, whether that's um, getting your body completely right. Tuesday for me would be, you know, a bit of a weight session, um, you know, with some pre- preparation, but also movement, getting back to feeling quite good. And then a session, a session outside, no contact. I wouldn't be out there for a maximum 45 minutes, but that would include all the forward stuff and the warm up, not what they normally do, which is we're out on the field for 45 minutes, not including 30 minutes of warm up, yeah. 30 minutes extras and warm ups. And I'd go through 30 minute units, 30 minutes units. I'd go through, I'd walk the, um, the moves and obviously I'd, I'd put the onus on the guys to put the learning in, in regards to stuff on the computers going, right. Here's the moves we're expecting to do this week. Here's the calls. Let's go through with it. Uh, Wednesday, I would just do one session in the morning, which would be kind of I'd do half an hour um, forward stuff and, and and you know and line outs. In the front row, love to hit some scrums, but I would limit that to go right. You know, five, and that's the max. If you don't do five, well, it also being out there for hours, mm. uh, you know, it, it has no bearing on how good you're going to be on a weekend. It's Wednesday. Mm. You smash that machine up and get it right. It doesn't translate yeah. to, to six days later. You, you you either know what's right, you either know what's correct. You might do some technical technique stuff, but you probably 
benefit more from doing that than just going live, but they do it because it sets the mindset. But that's mental. Mindset's a mental thing. It's not a physical thing. Um, and so, and then I'd have a day. I'd have a day off on on the Thursday. Bit of corporate activity. Bit of corporate activity. Yeah. yeah. And, and Friday, I would do, literally do half an hour. Go out there, feel good. Um, and I would go through go, go through a move, go through some unopposed, just run through a couple of kickoffs, bits and pieces, play Saturday. But I would then put the onus on the other times the guys have to do video analysis, to do a couple of walkthroughs. So I'd get the forwards and line to walk through lineouts again. And I put, you know, then I'd have a section a day for players to do their extras if they wanted to do, and have the coaches on standby to go right. Listen, say I like to put a couple of tack- tackles in on my shot or you know to get my shoulders in or just work as a technique but that'd be very controlled maximum of a couple of them you know go and do um some footwork stuff go and do some high ball stuff and it'd be very uh self-regulated by the players the facilities would be there but it wouldn't be dictatorial but the standards would have to maintain you'd have to maintain the standards on knowing the moves and that would be it i don't think you need to do it. all this idea that you've got to kick fuck out of each other and do all this like physical stuff i just don't think the game's I think that's going to be the thing that what he's going to get most out of it is is looking at how NFL now run their pre-seasons and then their seasons. So they're not doing, they're not going bone on bone at all during season. They, and I think, I think, I don't know if this is actually, I'm not sure for definite, but they have a window mm. in their pre-season where they can go live and they can do all the physical stuff. And then they, and then as soon as that goes into pre-season, uh, into the weeks of playing, that drops off a bit. I, I, and then during the season, it's off altogether. And that's the, the thing. The season is so much shorter. That, Maybe yeah. that is a... But why? But but why but do, yeah. It doesn't matter. As, as has said, I would be interested to see any stats that tell you you can get fitter during the season, during the season yeah. whilst you're playing. Because be it would be to get back for... Where, if you want to feel amazing on a Saturday, play a game, put yourself to the well, empty the, empty the tank, and then when you... To someone to tell me a marker of when I'm back to that level... Because yes. you shouldn't really do any anything really hard physically until you're back at that level where your your, your tank's full again. Yeah, you know they they had a they did a bit of a study. So for example, over a series of games, data that on your peaked games, so the, the best distance you ran, the most dominant collisions you had, most carries, most success rates. Basically, obviously you'd get a, a a mean of the amount of of how much you had to put in a week to get that result, and then that would be a guideline and go look. Do you know what? If I run more than eight k in the week, my game on the weekend dips mm. um I, I, I and that's one way of sort of measuring it i just think that if you were to ask how many premiership players go into a game on the weekend tired or sore or not feeling their best i think you'd be, you'd be shocked yeah which is ridiculous this is a performance-based game the whole idea is to peak on the weekend and the whole mentality has to change pre-season <laughs> pre-season you come out of pre-season broken and fucked to go into a season of x amount of games yeah why 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 you know bear in mind that your career now is 12 months a year because even in the holiday time say you take two weeks to to down the no downtime the other two weeks you know or four you know we get four or five weeks whatever it is now I and mean, i never really got four weeks maximum never got, four weeks. Never, got the, never got the most of it you you know you still got to then start preparing because you know day one clubs are going to go right fitness test which again is mental because what is the point we all know you're going to be a slightly unfit and then it's just to prove that you got fitter. It's just so stupid. The whole thing has to change. The whole thing's about performance, looking after players, but also taking an individual approach to managing the players. But people go, oh, we haven't got the staff, we haven't got the resources. Trust me, there will be enough players that need to work on that specific, specific skill. So I remember I went to Northampton, they were like, look, your accelerations are down, you know, your footwork timings aren't, you know, aren't great. I went, I spent eight weeks in preseason, you didn't do footwork or acceleration with me once. What did you think was going to happen? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no. What do you think was going to happen? Oh, okay. Well, maybe we should start doing that if that's what we need to work on. <laughs> so it, it, that's what you need to have. You know, there'll probably be 20 guys who could work on the mobility. There's probably 10 guys who have lower limb instability issues. There's probably 10 guys that have shoulder problems, right? That's what it should be. It should be about rolling you out on the weekend, feeling fucking a million dollars, mm. ready to run through the wall. And the remake, the days after that should all be about putting you back together, getting your markers exactly back to where you feel brilliantly and not trying to make massive advancements, but allow the timings for you to do some extra weight development, but even being monitored, no egos. Like don't try, you know, there's no, there's no point. Just try to manage it, feel good, tweak some bits 
and then and, and that's the way the whole season should go and you should be really brave about it but I don't think we're not you know because as soon as you lose one game right tackle suits on kick fuck out of each other right <laughs> you, you, right you're gonna run and do this what you're squatting in the gym what you're benching um, it's just it's madness. I'd be very interested to know because it does feel what what you've described there sounds very like what Quins are now doing, and they wear these gum shields which measure the force of impact, and they're pulling players out. They, their workload is very very light, I think, relative to what you've described yeah. there. It'd be very interesting to see what that is like across the board. I mean, yeah. what Hask has described there in terms of little, high quality, very targeted. How different is that relative to what you were doing in your prime? At oh yeah, I mean, but then also I would I'd look at myself and go I. You know, I was one of those who uh, never wanted to feel that I hadn't trained harder than anyone else there. So I would do everything. And that's so my actually, own a stuff. lot of the players even, might have to be protected even when, for themselves. Even when, yeah, even when physios are telling me, mate, don't need to train this week, just get yourself right. And I'm like, no, I have to train because it's just, I don't want anyone to think that I aren't, I'm not doing what I need to do or not training hard enough but that's that's my side of it but that's where your strength of your fitness coach go no get out of the get out of the gym go do some recovery you've got prehab set up you've got this set up you that's what you some players need that some players need to be actually no you need to get back in there your markers from the game on the weekend weren't that high yeah. so we feel we can we can give you an extra session but again it's not going to be contact based but it might just be that little that little either speed or fitness or whatever. Yeah, but back in the day, you know, you're doing, I mean, has would have known as well, you're doing fitness on Monday, for like full fitness games or whatever. You're doing double goo Tuesday with back sessions and forward sessions alike within that. Wednesday, you're doing quite a long attack session. Um, and then and then unit skills and then a weights. And then Thursday, day off, Friday, you do team run this team run. Do you th- do you, what I always so find about the training stuff, right, is we've talked about the psychology element, right? So using psychologists around the team. The reason that hasn't picked up as much as it should have done, and I know guys like Craig White have done stuff with with Harlequ- uh, with Harlequins, and we really want to get him on here because his you know his stuff he's done with um Uruguay, you know, when yeah. they beat Fiji, and he also did some stuff with another team the other day that they they got an amazing win and qualified for the World Cup series. He's obviously doing some amazing work, but the psychological point of view, the reason it doesn't stick in rugby is because the guys at the top never used it and don't believe in it. So if the ethos is set by, and, and the standards are set by those in charge the past. and the past, it it becomes a periphery thing. So you have a psychologist, but it's more because they've heard that it's the right thing to have as opposed to something they believe in. It's the same thing with his coaching and training mentality, right? I know um, Eddie is great at learning stuff, but he is obviously in his own right, you know, can be a hard taskmaster, taskmaster and has had, you know, a mentality to push the guys quite hard. Obviously not not into long periods and it's well thought out. It's very well managed, like military precision, but he has had a level of intensity. Until you get someone at the top who genuinely believes, and he might, he might do, that that's the way to do it. You know, I was exactly like Mike. I would have trained regardless, not listen to physios because there's almost that unwritten rule mm. that you have to train, you have to put the team first. But if the whole organization's mentality is performance, everything is set up, we're all on the same page. There isn't people talking in corners going, fucking no, he didn't turn up to training. He hasn't trained. Until you change the whole ethos like we need to do with psychology and rugby, nothing will change. And that's and that's what I really worry about with things like world rugby and the concussion and the, the training stuff. You know, when the RPA brought in the mandatory weeks off, Every club broke the rules. They would go, do you know what? You can have two weeks and the rest of the team are coming in for a self-advised preparation week and then you can come in for an extra week. It's like, but nobody didn't go in on that week because you imagine I was at Wasco, launches in, uh, Jack Willis is in and I'm there going, well, it was, self, it was a week. I'm not fucking going to do it. Everyone would judge you. You've got to take all of that out of everyone's hands and, and make it a blanket mentality. Maybe, and these are two just very quick points, maybe moving it down to a 10-team premiership and therefore you are removing three or four weekends of the calendar or whatever it would be gives you a bit more space to have the proper breaks. But the, the thing I almost want to tie the two topics that we've discussed together here is that you've got to have quite a lot of sympathy for Eddie Jones. If he's trying to get a group of players who you have said are not necessarily playing the type of rugby that is representative of the international game on a week-to-week basis in the premiership. He needs to get them up to speed as quickly as possible ahead of November. But you're saying players need to be given as much a lighter yes, workload. But it, how, that, I mean, how do you how do you square the circle? Yeah, well, into your mic. <laughs> yeah, but I think at the same time he's not work he's not working with players who haven't been there and haven't done it. They know the levels well, where they've got to get got to. Guys like Tom Roebuck joined up. Well, he's got people like. 
Yes, he's got. But they've also it's down to the players to have, help educate those, those guys as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm just, I'm just not sure. Are, that you are a very right. Easy I mean, solution are, the, diffi- the, the, di- the difference between test test match rugby and what goes on in the Premiership is just time. You have everything is reduced. You have less time. You have less time on the ball. You have less time to make a decision. You have less time to think. Now, players... Who, is it not more physical as well? Yeah, of course, it, it, but that comes from the less time. Okay. And it's, uh, can you operate at your skill level in a smaller window of time? Uh, Running but, faster, quicker into yeah, each other. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, but but you'll fi- you figure those players out pretty quickly whether you have that ability or not. They can step up. You know, you look at any... You'll always think of a player who was amazing at premiership level and then never made it an international because they're used to having that time and they when they have that time they can maximize their physical advantage over everyone else uh but there are other other players who d- may not stand out at premiership but yet they can cut a, a international because they just either have that physical edge or they can they can still do everything under the same time pre- precedent that other people can't and yes it'll be more physical through through because that's the nature of why they call test matches but uh i still think you've got to embrace what they are as a player you can't as you would put it you can't put square pegs into round holes so you have to make the team play in the way that best suits those individuals that you're going to make take the field one of the clubs i was at i said you've got me for eight or nine hours a day Right. I'm asking you, and I can see that as my career went on towards the end of it, I was like, mobility was, was was something that was really important to me. I didn't, people thought I was, you know, always labeled me as a meathead and I was in the gym all the time. And, and you know, they, well, the best stuff I ever did for England was 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 under Eddie. And they're always like, you know, you're your lightest, you're your most mobile, bollocks. I was the heaviest I'd ever been, um, but I wasn't doing any weight training. I was just, I do, I do one session per week, everything else is mobility. Um, but people, you know, but then when I, you know, people then would say, oh, you you know, you're a meathead, you're doing too much to the gym. I wasn't, I was never doing it. So what people think from the outside is completely irrelevant. But ultimately, um, I would manage my stuff, but I would come to the club and go, look, my area is mobility, acceleration. That's the most important. Thing. I don't need to be any bigger. I don't need to be any more physical. I need to recover and I need to do this. Well, actually, we want you to do this. It's important that you're seen to do the right things. Do them afterwards. I went, if you've got me for nine hours a day and you can't make me better in nine hours a day, what the hell are you doing? And that is my biggest criticism is that it's not individualized. It's not it's not thought out. And actually, most of the time, the club stuff has no benefit for England on shows no and, and isn't joined up. So one of the things I think about New Zealand and the franchise stuff is they work very closely, mm. talk to each other. The style of play is pretty similar yeah. across the board and they have a, a certain mentality. And actually, we interviewed um, Warren Gatland and he said that it can be quite detrimental. Yeah. Unfortunately, that the All Blacks, you know, way of doing things and, and the way of the standards they expect can actually be detrimental at club level. I'd love to get to the point where, you know, the standards at England were, you know, maybe being detrimental because, you know, clubs wanted to branch out a bit. But instead, it's the other way around. Clubs don't really want to do anything to help England because it doesn't doesn't really serve them any purpose. It doesn't mm. benefit them in any, single, any way. It'd be very interesting to pick this up with, Jack and Ellis at some point, hopefully post November, and actually Foxy Davis as well, who is sort of half centrally contracted, half Scarlet. Just cash money, isn't it? Just cash money <laughs> coming in from all angles. Um, very interesting, and I don't think the solution is is necessarily going to fall from the skies anytime soon. But it does feel, and the more the, the, the dramas go on, we'll, we'll come on to the clubs in just a moment or two. But the more the, the sort of the, the chaos abounds the more this has got to get straightened out, sorted out, so that everything is working for the benefit of everybody rather than we're taking lumps out of each other. i tell you what, though, hey-ho, um, we're often light and shade here on The Good, The Bad and The Rugby. We have been trying to get this into the last four shows of the season. Uh, we have failed, but time for a bit of nonsense. Time for a new segment. This is The Bin Juice. So would you like to tell the good people about it, Hoff? It feels like a good time to do it. A little bit of light. Oh, Lord, here we go. <laughs> Given what went on on the Lions Tour, this sort of grew out of the term midweek veg in 2017. This is a new section on the good, the bad, and the rugby. Very shiny It bin. may well be the only time it gets done, but let's hope not. This I'm is actually, can we, we're going to... Oh, can we just make sure ever. your neighbour's not in there yet, is he? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> my neighbour's gazebo blew through my fence on a new house today. Very disappointing. Yeah. Very we, disappointing. we all want to be there when you hand it back to him. <laughs> He'll be wearing his gazebo for the next few weeks. Right, this is bin juice. Yes. Off, so away we go. We have a man on the inside. I was bin juice for a while. Tins, I don't think you ever were bin juice, were you? 
Uh, no, I don't think no, you've ever, never been juiced. I was, good. I was been juiced a couple of times, but we have a we have a very special uh, feature this week. Um, and actually comes out of a bin, if you're listening. It we is, have got yes. a bin out of which the bin juice story of the week is produced. Yes, the, thank fuck there's no actual bin juice in, in there because bin juice is rank. rank. Can we just quickly, before we get into it, can you just define bin yeah, juice so, for those who don't uh, know? So bin juice, um, basically bin juice is... If you've ever put rubbish away, that liquid at the bottom of a bin, which <laughs> it essentially... I put my bin and had a load of maggots down yeah, the bottom. Yeah, oh, do, 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 do you know what bin men call that? They call it bin rice. Do they? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, bin rice. Yeah, you right. go, you know. Um, but uh, basically, the bin juice are integral to every single team, right? They're not the superstars, but they're the guys that tie everything together. And if the bin juice goes off and basically doesn't, it, it doesn't take part in it, everything falls apart. And they're the guys that basically make a living from never getting there they don't get paid very well they're never going to make it and even if they do do really well in training i've seen a lot of binges carve up uh the starting team on the weekend only for the defensive coach what the fuck are you doing the fuck are you doing and i you know they're the ones that get blamed for everything but they're the first ones on the team social they're the ones where all the stories are based on they're also so so important to every single team um they've been called many different things dirt trackers um, midweek, midweek, veg. midweek veg, driftwood, but bin juice for me really sums up what it's like to be a journeyman rugby player. Whether whether the best you're going to get is just average and mediocre. Love it. Um, and so we've got a man on the inside, um, and we know you guys obviously love bin juice on this show. Uh, whether it's the bench warmers in the prem or the third team at grassroots level, we know these guys offer a lot. Now I've got a mate who's going to anonymously reveal little stories um, we're going to call him the juice the juice you know who you are no one will ever find out who the juice is now he's going to send us a story every few weeks uh, keep us up to date at life at the bottom because we talk about life at the top but what's it like when you've got no job opportunities we should actually ask Boris Johnson <laughs> <laughs> uh, and boy do we have a good one to kick us off so here we go there was a loose head prop that was signed for uh, signed by Ealing with all the kind of excitement, pomp and circumstance that he was going to be a very big deal. But unfortunately, for some bizarre reason, he never really made it and ended up in the bin juice. Now, no one is quite sure why, but this story may shed light on it. The problem was this, Lou said when he signed, he was brilliant, but every game that progressed, he sort of got more found out. His conditioning wasn't great. And let's be honest, he was described as rather soft. He just didn't have what it took. Now, one of the S&C coaches was doing his rounds of the houses to see what uh, players were up to when he came across a certain house where this loose head player, loose head prop lived. And he found an ashtray with 20 camel blue sitting next to it and a lighter and about a million fag butts. Now, after interrogating all the lads, including this loose head who lived there, to ask who the smoker was, he couldn't get the answers he wanted. Everyone was straight faced. No one was going to rat. No one was going to snitch. But this is where it gets very good this particular snc refused to take no for an answer and he had a bee in his bonnet he wanted to know why his team were underperforming and why this loose head in particular was out of breath the entire time so he got the club analyst to use the drone and sent it over the top of their house every evening or at lunch breaks so the lads would be in the house they suddenly hear this and a drone would fly over the top of their house everyone would scatter and the anal analyst at the SNC unfortunately never caught anybody smoking. And they used to do it time after time. And every time they'd see the drone go up, lads would be running for cover. Eventually, the SNC guy lost his lost the plot, called the loose head prop in, interrogated him, said to him, Listen, we know it's you. We know it's you. We haven't got the footage, but we know it's you. But the player never ever gave in, never ever admitted. But he still ended up in the bin juice. And that is why he never made it. Best use of company property of all time, I would I'm, say. I've never, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I've never imagine, imagine sending up a drone continuously to chase someone down, try and catch them smoking. But that also has to be the first rule of bin juice: never admit. Never admit. I mean, that's a good thing. Not one of them folded under pressure, even yeah. with aerial surveillance. <laughs> they didn't once give in, which I think is quite, quite, quite good. I mean, apart from hacking the phones and installing hidden cameras, they did pretty well. But it is amazing how uh, you know uh, these players turn up at these clubs with big, you know big hype and then they end up in the absolute binges carrying bags you know filling water bottles and having a tab out the back what's wonderful is is the way you can end up in binges some people are delighted to, to get that high and others fall into it and can never escape but it, 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 one question about binges once you're in binges can you ever escape or is no. it like a swamp of 
No, some people do escape. But people I can make it out. You off. can make it out, but actually I is think... Is escape only via retirement? <laughs> no, <laughs> escape is via selection and continued games for for the first team. Yeah. But I think you never forget your bin juice heritage. That's the important <laughs> thing because you understand that when it was, you know, the coaches wouldn't really know your name. You know, they'd say that they thought, you know, they, they would say, listen, we're going to rotate you out, but they'd never rotate you back in. Um, there's a lot of excuses. So you kind of, once you've had that taste of kind of being overlooked and laughed at, you never lose it. Even if you go and make it, you still like to fraternise with the guys who are there. You know, they're the guys that on the day one of pre-season, they go, you know, we well, hope you have a big season and they just never get picked again. Right. Binju submissions are open. Send them in to, I can't even remember what our email address is, something at goodbadrugby.com. Info at goodbadrugby.com. Try that. Let's move on because we've got a quick note from our new friends back for week two, our partners at NordVPN. Welcome along once again, who are offering the good, the bad and the rugby listeners an exclusive deal to protect your internet connection and privacy online something that we definitely recommend from personal experience <coughs> to my left. NordVPN has loads of great features, including protecting your data whilst traveling and using public Wi-Fi. It also allows you to save money on purchasing subscriptions from other countries for a cheaper price. Has can apparently purchase, in inverted commas, Netflix. <laughs> I tried to think the other uh, my <laughs> subscriptions that you've got whilst being connected to NordVPN's Mexican servers or TIN's premium YouTube. Should you be going anywhere overseas? in the next few weeks. I mean, I used, I actually, when I lived abroad, I used uh, VPN, NordVPN um, quite a bit because you were able to watch UK streaming stuff over here. Feel, feeling like you're at home. Yeah, and you can Good. be, at, you know, that was very, very useful. Home, um, you can which you paid, your yeah. Grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash goodbadrugby. You'll get a huge discount on your plan and four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Perhaps we'll put that into the bundle for bin juice submissions as well shall we have a quick word about the women's world cup red roses we've touched on it already 28 victories in a row now congratulations to all involved they've absolutely dispatched south africa 75 nil 13 tries a mouth-watering quarterfinal therefore against our old friends australia which will be in the early hours this weekend funny enough in 2003 your lot got the job done despite perhaps not playing the better rugby that they were 12 months before. Are we seeing an England side that is doing what needs to be done, isn't quite where it wants to be, or is holding back on the reins for what is now arriving on the horizon? Yeah, I'm not I'm not entirely sure, but having watched the New Zealand game and the, some of the offloads that they were doing in the game, keeping the ball alive, we talk about partnerships and, you know, feeding off of how you play. It, if you're playing well, that confidence grows and the, some of the offloads that the New Zealand team did. Um, whereas all our stuff against South Africa, yes, 75 nil is an absolute drumming, but I feel that we could have beaten South Africa in whatever, whichever way you want to try mm. and play it. And I think we scored six push over tries or seven line out malls or something like that. And it was just like Jess breach. Um, and, and Abby Dow didn't touch the ball for the whole first half. I mean, just not how we're used to when you go back to the autumn last year and the Six Nations. That's not how we played. Now, we talked earlier about whether we're holding stuff back and it was just like, you just don't want to be doing that. You want to be hitting the ground, everyone confident and just getting out there and smashing it. So there is, for the first time, not a little bit of doubt in me because, you know, the first game where we've had to really front up was France, was France and we got held up over the line twice where, you know, from just poor pick and go, well, whether it's poor pick and, pick and go technique or whether it's great defence, it's whichever camp you want to sit in. But we still could have been way ahead and then we finished really nervous on the back of that. Now, all that's done is provide everyone else confidence that they can come after us. Whereas I feel if we, we just play our normal game, we'd, we'd just put people to the sword anyway. Mm. So um, I still got confidence. It's still theirs to lose, I believe, but um, I would prefer them to be playing slightly better than what they are. England take on Australia, Canada take on the USA. So England will, fe well, should England get past the um, Australian women's team, they will play either Canada or USA, both of whom they beat in the summer, I think I'm right yeah. saying. On the other side of the draw, it's New Zealand, Wales. Good luck to Wales. Uh, and France against Italy. So I think you'd be brave to bet against the New Zealand, France semi-final in that side of the draw. So let's have a little word and a check-in, shall we, from the good, the scars and the rugby, Elma Smith. Welcome along to the good, the scars and the rugby in partnership with Vodafone. We've reached uh, the end of the pool stages. The quarterfinals uh, have been decided. So with the help of this week's guest, we're going to 
take a look ahead and find out what we can expect. I'm joined by Bryony Cleal, who, not, let's not make any bones about it, didn't make uh, the cut for the Red Roses squad out in New Zealand, but was very much in the running to go all summer, right up until the end. And she was a big part of that England camp. How are you, Bryony? I have yeah. seen a bit of you recently. I mean, it was the watch party. Um, in town, and then you came and did the lawnmower and some rugby keepy uppies with us on World Rugby's breakfast party. Um, we've had a little beer off camera. Um, how's your heart? How are you doing? Yeah, I tried to forget the lawnmower to be honest, but I did have a good time uh, filming that. And and just it's been a bit of rugby fever at the moment, isn't it, with the World Cup over here? So I've got stuck into his, um, quite a few events and things, and um, just been yeah, I think tough isn't it like to get so close and and obviously not be in New Zealand um but I think I've had to get over it more quickly maybe than others because I've got a twin sister out there who um obviously I'm supporting and I'm, I'm flying out soon to go watch the back end of the tournament as long as I get to watch my sister in a world cup final I'll be happy I remember this now it's it's madness you're traveling for like 99 hours and you're going to be on the ground for 24 or something like that yeah no, yeah so yeah you remember yeah something like that but I've spoken to a resident Kiwi who says I'm absolutely mad, but it is a, I couldn't take too much time off because obviously we're still here playing rugby. Um, couldn't take that much time off and uh, ov obviously did want to go out there and watch um, the World Cup final. I was completely kind of blindsided by Poppy's post over the weekend. I mean, she's been an absolute stalwart in the back row over the last few years, but she only got her first start in a World Cup. This weekend now gone. Yeah, so um, she. I remember her texting me. I remember we've had loads of conversations. We spoke so much, and then the other day she was, yeah, the, hopefully this will be my like first start. And I was like, what? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, you just don't think, do you? Because she's been around for so many years and it's got so many caps and done so much of her career. You forget that she's yeah hasn't. So um, I, and what part of the heart I took about not getting into this World Cup squad was the fact that that happened to. Poppy in 2017 she didn't make it and in fact there was an injury that made she got called up so went to the World Cup eventually um, but um, yeah she's actually gone through it World Cup wise so yeah I'm so happy she got her first start and my parents got there this week so they got to see her play um, and it was obviously yeah I think the post alluded to it being my granny's birthday and we lost her in the, sum uh, in the summer so I think that was super special and she sent some pictures to us all some flowers that she'd put out to the, into the New Zealand uh, ocean. So, yeah, really sweet. And I think my um, granny might have been helping her over the line a couple of times. So, I mean, rugby really is like, I mean, it's in the family, like in such a big way that that video of your granny being so excited. I know. And, oh, it's... I, to be honest, this World Cup's probably brought my family, made them even more rugby mad. Like I've got cousins who are up every every morning with a picture on the group watching the World Cup and watching Poppy. So they've truly embraced it. And I think they tell a lot of people about it too. So it's 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 been such a good World Cup, but from a family, it's been special as well. You really can't escape it. I mean, it's on the family WhatsApp group. Your um, first rugby club is so into the Red Roses and the fact that they can really boast about you guys. Tell us about Ellingham and Ringwood RFC. Yeah, they're such a good club, um, just in, in the community, but then also in the kind of girls rugby scene um, with everything they've done. Um, and the fact that they were back in the day pushing me and my sister and to play and, and giving us opportunities to play with what they do. We used to have to join local other clubs just to play and then Honestly, I think that my rugby club would became a taxi service and we'd pick girls up from all over the place just so we could car carry on playing. I'm pretty sure that's why my dad brought like an eight-seater back in the day. So they just pushed and pushed and pushed for the girls' section and the women's section to do so well. And I know even now I get loads of updates from them or get, uh, telling us who's got into the under-18s TDG or who's gone on to play county. And they've had a watch party most recently where you could buy a breakfast um, they had two options. I think it was a Cleo and the Scarret. Um, I remember seeing the ad, the, the, the ad and thought, why is, firstly, why is the Cleo like one sausage, one piece of bacon and one egg and the Scarret two sausages, two bacon? I thought someone's messed it up here. And then I, and then I also thought, wait a minute, why is Emily Scarret eggs, bacon and, and sausage? And why is she not like eggs Benedict on sourdough bread with spinach <laughs> and hollandaise sauce? I thought someone's messed this one up. Like, that's, like Scarret should be like, 
top top tier like posh dinner and probably should be your fried bread bread and your your hash browns and your sunny side up eggs <laughs> And then they could do they could do a menager or a Laura Saint Suze and do a French toast as well. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, if they wanted yeah. to broaden the offering there. Yeah, they could, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> but the clear one being one bacon, one sausage, one egg for five pounds. I mean, that's still good value. But oh, I yeah, do feel, I feel like they missed the trick there about it being doubles of everything. Yeah, I feel like they did miss a trick. But no, I, I think Poppy was fishing to see who had bought who got who got the most buyers. Was it the clear or was it the scarlet? Um, to see but no they, they're they so supportive Ellen as a club and I one day I'll get down there and have my own clue love that I feel like Emily's rugby club needs to catch up here because other people are making money out of that name already yeah I'm um, surprised they haven't got paid uh, scars from like like money for her name or something <laughs> we need to we need to go watch the game there and have have the scarret and the cleal and just properly review it and see yeah. if the scarret is really worth the eight quid <laughs> Um, England put up 75 points on South Africa this weekend, but obviously as the South African here, um, no, I'm not going to talk about the ref. I'm just going to say the <laughs> score does not reflect the level of entertainment, at least for the first 20 to 30 minutes of that game. For me, um, that's a mental score. Let's talk about professionalisation. What did you think? Yeah, um, no, you're completely right. The first 10, 20 minutes, I have to go, it's like for the, for the Fiji, Fiji as well, wasn't it? First 10, 20 minutes, I don't know if ever we at Red Roses get a bit shocked by it, but they really, a, a few times I thought South Africa were going to go, they're, they're line breaking, they're line breaking down the wing, um, and you thought, oh, hello, they're here to turn, they're here to play, um, and they were well worth well worth the watch. But when it comes to that, that level of professionalism and that 30 minutes, 40 minutes, when you're getting into the second half, that's when it, it tells. Because to to put the level of performance up like like a fr that the French did the week before with such a defensive effort, it takes full that it takes full time athletes on a full time regime on conditioning programs that will make mean that you can compete with other athletes that are on that level of conditioning. So mm. it's tough, but I think it, it, you can take heart like as a South, as as the South African um, Union, you can take heart from that and go, all right, our girls can do it. Like all we need to do is put that money in, put that time in and put the professionalism into them that actually they can, they can compete and that first 20 minutes should be complete shining light for them to, to say what they can do because they've done that on on amateur with amateurs um, with not a lot of, not as many years behind them as the Red Roses have done. So it's mm. great. I feel like it's great for them to come to the World Cup, to be, be on the world stage, to be playing like they did, to be performing like they, they and show the um, kind of, where where they can get and the promise promise they have and all I know is I already nudged LJ and said you need to get on the phone to Healy I said you need to get her over here <laughs> and also I love ready? that I love the fact that it's like a window for them to be playing on the world stage that people can go we want her we want her. because all this time we've got we've got every Canadian and American under the sun but there's players out there in South Africa who would tear this this league apart. If you haven't watched Aceza Hele play just yet, you need to go find the South African number eight. She is absolute box office. I mean, her stats, I actually screen grabbed it. Let me find it because I screen grabbed it this morning because I saw someone posting it and I went, this girl has literally just taken this World Cup for absolutely everything it's worth. She knew she was probably only going to have three games at the tournament. 241 running meters, 37 tackles, 34 carries, 21 defenders beaten, seven passes, four offloads, three turnovers, three line breaks, and a try. There we yeah. go. Yeah. She came, yeah, no. she conquered, and now she's going back to South yeah. Africa. Um, on the topic of professionalization, Rassi Erasmus did say when he was asked about it that he's right behind the women's team. He says it's been a successful tournament. Obviously, you need context here for where they've come from. They brought in Lynn Cantwell as a high performance manager. She's Ireland's most capped player of all time. She brought in Jill Burke to really up the coaching and the resources available to the team. But what I think a lot of people don't understand is where these girls come from and the kind of odds they've had to overcome. Lusanda Dumke won uh, the Eastern Cape Sports Star Award earlier this year. And she, was, she won a car, a little hatchback. And she was so excited and photos were posted of Lusanda winning a hatchback. She was a student, when I spoke to her last year, she was a student living in a dorm. 
and she had to forfeit the car so that she could rather get some money to invest in a house for her granny and they were literally living in a corrugated iron shack until she won this car and the car has changed the living conditions for her family on a daily basis and this is one of so many such stories where taking 75 points to some people feels like oh why even try but there is just so much more at stake and there is so much greater impact being had by rugby than what ends up on the scoreboard at the end of the game. Could you say that they have to then put, therefore have put, been putting in more effort than the Red Roses have in the last six months because we get it, we get it in a sense easier because we get told where to go on, on this week. And I saw quite a video about the Fijians and some of them were like, yeah, we come to training, but we can't leave. And it's one in the morning, one evening, but we have to stay here all day because we can't either one, it's too far to come or two, afford the bus journey back to my home. So I have to stay here. Someone brings some food and then we just chill out for the day. And you think, yeah, you hope that in, well, firstly, in three years time in 2025, they're going to be different beasts in the sense that they're going to be even better. Um, so that's going to be huge for them. And then two, we hope that from this World Cup that we can now give um, people more support or the unions can give them more support and more help to to allow them to one own her own car for, you know and keep the car because she can then sort her family out and and sort herself out and be in a situation where rugby's given back to her what she's given to it so much bigger than that it's a bit like scotland and the tears that you saw flowing at the end of that game where it just puts into perspective with the scottish girls you know they've dropped out of the tournament now but they can really hold their heads high they've put in massive efforts um a bit like south africa and fiji and japan yeah like and i, I always think about um i read a post one of the one of the posts um christine Bilal put it up and just talked about the memories as well and like they've obviously all gone out there they've made such unbelievable memories while playing rugby and while given the opportunity to play on the world stage and play in such a, a tournament so for all of the girls that are leaving the world cup it, it must be truly something special that they've just Got, had experience for the last four weeks and I just hope that they go back and every every team that's leaving the, the tournament now goes home and firstly never forgets the memories they made and then secondly it, they help them push their unions to offer them the support that they should be getting and, and they push their unions to give them even more of a platform to do it again in three years time so now let's quickly talk about England change team not the normal captain-vice-captain combo that we've gotten used to. Santa was mic'd on the touchline. Skaz wasn't there. Marley as a captain. Talk to <laughs> us about this. She she was captain when you were at Saracens, right? Or yeah, she kept, yeah, she did. There was, yeah, co-captain for a bit while we were at um, Saris. And you, everyone says there's different types of leaders. Ones that like talk, talk like uh, the best talkers. The ones that like um, G you up with the words and then you just and then there's some that do it by actions and Marley is the action one um everything she does she does like on a rugby pitch as well everything she does she does with every like inch of her her, her um, effort and ability like she's like a bowling ball of energy um you know she like there's one person if there's niggle Marley's there if there's <laughs> any 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 moment where she can give her team support she's doing it any moment where she can put her body on the line for the team she's doing it so in that sense she's the epitome of like a leader that leads by action not one that you'd go and well you, you'd want to listen to too often because every second word's a swear word in that sense she's not she's not as like the spoken that santa is when she comes in and and inspires by her words she's one that um by her actions and I, that's why he did it because i think mids knows that that's what you're going to get from marley and knows that she's not going to step back and and she's probably proven over the years. She's never been given that, that um, captaincy before, but I think with the amount of trust he has in her and the the fact that I, I probably believe that this year has been the best of her career, that this is the time that she's taken over and, and got the game that she can do at the World Cup. I, I Honestly, I just love watching her play. Um, let's talk about the forwards. I, I mean, I'm sure you've loved all of this forward dominant <laughs> performance. I mean, Flat said, who needs a back line? Not no, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but will this get them anywhere against, for example, a New Zealand 
who gets the ball all over the place and does all kinds of crazy things with it. I mean, the mall was incredible. It was incredible. And I love me a mall. Um, but what's plan B? I, mean, I, I keep reading this, like, where's England's plan B? And uh, But I just think you don't need to do it. I'm like, at this at club, I'm like, why? Like, or there's a line out and we're nailing this line out. I'm like, why, why change it? If it ain't broke, you don't change it. Um, so for me, yeah, I, 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 I think we don't, England, for me, like, well, obviously I've trained with them. They've got so much more to their game than this mall. But this is what we're really good at. So you make that super strength as super possible. And if you need it, I will kid you not, Zoe Harrison will put some kind of tempence for Claude on the wing or Scaz will run a, a line and there'll be a no look off. You know, there's so many tricks they do have. It, they are There is a plan B, but you don't need your plan B until your plan A doesn't work. So... And people said it against the the, the the French team, but ultimately who who won the game in the end as well. So I do think that um, yeah, not as much as I the seventh more was I did I did the six a.m. alarm and the seventh more I was like oh god, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they do definitely have so many more tricks up their sleeve, and they're so good and so talented. I don't see um, us I don't see us needing to worry about their plan B. Okay, let's talk about the quarterfinals and what people can look forward to. Italy, the first time ever that Italy has made it through to a quarterfinal in a Rugby World Cup men's or women's. They face France at 4.30am on Saturday. After that, at 7.30am, New Zealand play Wales. Wales is still in this thing. Um, New Zealand should dominate, but they played each other last week. Ruby Tui said it didn't feel like they completely ran away with it. Um, Wales, a massively passionate rugby nation. And now, I mean, they have nothing to lose. They could just cause the biggest upset ever. And they could really just put in an insane fight and leave really proud, even if they don't win. So they must be absolutely relishing this. Well, we, we talked about it in my house this week. We said, oh, what do you do if you're Wales? Because on the back of a 58 nil loss, you then think, well, like, what? and I said, oh, are they going to have as much fun as possible? And then I remembered they were Welsh. And I thought, no, they are going to be fighting every sinew of their bodies and, like, they'll put in everything on the line. It will be a physical game, and I know that then Welsh will front up and, um, yeah, it won't be the same scoreline. On Saturday night, if you're out late, make sure uh, that you're still around at 1.30am for England playing Australia. This unbeaten run is just building and building and building. Australia, so far, this tournament... Grace Hamilton, oh my gosh, but also just in general, love it. Firstly, it's exciting to play England play them because I don't think that's not happened for years. And then in a quarterfinal of a World Cup, obviously as a child, 2003, I've watched England, Australia many times in the World Cup. So that's exciting too. Um, but I just think, um, again, they're a team that's going to get so much better in the three years. A bit will be a good game. It'll be something different for England, something really different. And they're all coming over to the Premier 15s too. About five of them, I think, are all coming over come a month's time when we start our league. So it'll be interesting to have them because that's what I've been doing, writing notes. They're all off to Harlequin. Oh, wow. Mm. So we are going to be seeing tons of them in action here in England very shortly. And so there is a bit of also just measuring ourselves against our future league opponents. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think there will be. Just and add a dynamic there. 3.30 on Sunday morning, Canada-USA. The rematch of the grudge match over the weekend. Score at the weekend, 14-29 in favour of Canada. Um, let's get a quick semi-final prediction for you. France, Italy. <laughs> France will win that. Okay, so France and then New Zealand, Wales. Are you going New Zealand? New Zealand. So then France, New Zealand. That's take. That is a tasty game, but New Zealand are winning. And then England, Australia, you're going in favour of Eng your sis. Yeah. Canada, England. USA. Canada. And then England, Canada. England. Okay, there we However, go. However, France, mm -hmm. Italy, I am so excited to watch France, Italy and the USA, Canada game. They're going to be the games of the round. The games of the round. France, Italy. I think that one. France, Italy. <sighs> Now, uh, speaking of all to play for, wasps, you are repping the stash. You're wearing your, yeah. your wasps uh, hoodie there, uh, living the brand. Now, um, the Allianz Prem 15s features a wasps team. As the boys have mentioned on the pod almost every week since they came back, things aren't looking good. Uh, the club's gone into administration. But you are wasps FC, not tied to the men's club in Coventry. But you do rely on funding from there. 
So when are you hoping to know next steps by and how does it feel in camp at the moment? Well, I've just come I've just finished the gym and, I, and one of the comments in the gym was the vi the energy and the um, vibe so good considering I think someone literally went considering everyone's lost their jobs. Um, so I think that that is still there and I think that's always been there with wasps. Everyone says it, don't they? It's a family, um, not a club and I think that's still paramount. But obviously it's a situation where everyone has lost their jobs um, and there's Yes, we are at WASF FC, so our registration hasn't been affected. We still can enter the league and not be suspended. But ultimately, some of the funding did come from um, the WAS Holdings, which is a men's company. So people have obviously not getting paid now. They've all been made redundant. So it's just an unknown entity. I think any every day is a little. We could find out something different. And I know at the moment we didn't play last week. Um, we still un don't know about this week. Um, but we're definitely got our eyes on being back in the league and being in a situation where the funding is there to make us operational. Um, the funding's there to pay our medical, our S and C, our head our head coaches. Um, and like, obviously, we forget that there's people in the World Cup right now who have signed for WASP over the summer and what are they coming back to? So it's a really unknown entity. Um, we, we're still training down here. Um, we're still like super positive. The messages coming out of our women's sport at the moment is something that you want people are investing in. People see the future of women's sport. People see the promise in us. And I read an Abby Dow BBC Sport um, article talking about it and how she reckons it's an opportunity to fight for us and and she wants to crack on, stay on and, and be here. So we're all in a good place. It's just financially we're not, <laughs> I think, wow. the answer to that. It's so much insecurity to deal with, considering everything you've been through. I really appreciate uh, how warmly and passionately you, you still speak about the game because you have every <laughs> reason to just go, Alma, no, actually, yeah. leave me alone. But I love it. <laughs> I think mean, I did for a couple of days, but um, I remember, yeah, when when the first start of the month happened, I said, LJ was like, just go away and do anything. And I went into central London and ate my way around central London. Most people said, are you going to go have a beer? I said, no, I'm going to go eat a lot, you know? <laughs> so I think I went and did that. But it's been, oh, it's been such a tough um, month with rugby. But like I said earlier, I think my passion and my love for rugby and my want to support my sister, I think, kind of the, the what's made me say so positive about it i love that that's really beautiful there you go don't don't show that though now we have to get on to the serious business next which is the fact that i have genius uh rugby analyst cats i mean have you seen that stuff genius genius they are to be honest if <laughs> no i can't say this I said, if you if you put me in a room with your husband or you and said, go to one of them, I think I'd go to you too. Oh, <laughs> Brian. <laughs> sorry, sorry to your husband. I think Shira's going to keep that in. I think Shira's <laughs> definitely not cutting that out. <laughs> I Well, I'm here for the cat predictor. And if uh, anyone else, the, else out there has a fish or a parrot or another pet, that wants to agree with our genius cats, uh, then get stuck in and film your own uh, predictor challenge. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, thank you for joining us, Bryony. No, you're very welcome. Make sure you head on over to the Good, the Scars and the Rugby Socials to stay across all of the drums of the tournament. Uh, we've got Team of the Week every week. We're chatting to fans. We've got head-to-heads to watch out for. We'll keep your diary up to date with basically when you need to set your alarm for. And if you haven't watched the Cat Predictor yet, then, I mean... Look at your life and look at your choices because you are missing out on some prime rugby insight right there. We've been the good, the scars and the rugby. Thank you for joining me for this little whistle stop tour uh, through the end of the pool stages. Bryony and back to you, Alex. The leaves are turning though. This is quite poetic. The weather is getting colder and that means only one thing. The Autumn Nation Series Rugby begins again live on Amazon Prime Video. Our good friends and yours, hopefully. Japan hosts New Zealand at 10 to 7 this Saturday morning, 29th of October. Scotland then take on the Wallabies at Murrayfield at 5.30 later that evening. Interesting with Scotland, though. They feel like they're going through quite a period of evolution, revolution, and all change as well. No captaincy for Stuart Hogg, no Finn Russell, who responded with 18 points, and a, I'm loving my rugby in Paris. It's obviously still not quite what it could be and should be between him and Gregor. Yeah, and this falls this falls down to... Uh, oh, um, sorry, they left Finn Russell out? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fucking hell. 
wrong with these people? Uh, so this goes, you know, back to has continuous point, tall poppy syndrome, whatever. You get someone who actually just sits slightly above the game. I think I think Finn Russell does sit above the game. I think though he's very unique from his attitude uh, of how he approaches the game completely unfazed mentally he could make 20 mistakes in a row and then he'll still pull off a worldie of a pass or a worldie yeah. of a kick that will win you a game and he doesn't go through the like the emotional roller coaster of making mistakes like other players do if he isn't getting on with a coach you don't have to be best friends with a coach he gives a shit well, as long he as he's professional delivers and he's not so disruptive that it's a problem. I don't, I don't see what the issue is. It's just, that's poor management. That's, that's I can't handle this bloke. I can't handle this talent. I'm intimidated by it. So I'm going to make some outlandishly stupid decision not to include him in. Which so ironically, the point is, Gregor was that type of player when he I played. Know. I know. So, What's Mercurial. Yeah. Not, I, I, you know, I don't yeah. want to fight with Gregor Townsend. Yeah, yeah. I really like you, but I'm just saying, you know, I, I don't understand why you wouldn't do that. I think so many coaches bottle it when they see Something like that. You can't tell me that they are not going to take him to the World Cup. So, yeah. well, I, I, <laughs> whether they do or they don't, you, you, Scotland. I'm amazed if Scotland are in a position to not be able to utilise a talent like Finn Russell. No, that's what I mean. That's, what, that's what I mean. I mean, do you think it comes down to fitting in with other players as opposed to coaches? Well, we know we look, we, just, we all know players and friends with some of those players that um, the reason they don't get selected, and no one's got the balls to say, it, is that they're just so disruptive to other players and they're, and they're, their own mental health issues and own inability to deal with criticism or, or non-selection. Pass on. Or pass on and make everything about themselves. So, yes, I don't know what he's like. I can't I can't tell you. We know that there's been drinking incidents in the past. There's been a few things in the past that have meant that he hasn't towed the party line. He's done things his own way. Ugh. I mean, are they ever that bad? I, I don't know. You don't... It, well, it doesn't help when nowadays that then media people grass on you yeah. to your coach as well. So you can't no, really snitches. have any... Yeah, get stitches. Stuart Hogg no longer captain. Jamie Ritchie coming in as skipper as well. I mean, that almost feels like a bit of a feels like a bit of an period of evolution. But who's who's yeah. going to start at ten? Just just go back. Gregor. <laughs> <laughs> Adam um, Hastings. Hastings. Hell of a drop goal. Yeah, it was a great drop goal. That that will come Blair to that on my Horn. moment of the week. Um, Cam Redpath. Oh, he'll play twelve. Will 12 he probably. probably. But he did well with that naughty little interception. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, he made a quite a nice little line break earlier as well, didn't he? To, um, he's been really struggling with his fitness, hasn't he? But he's, I think he's well, really he was player. injured. He came back. And, the thing you know, about Finn though, the other is day. he has delivered so often. Well, he's, he's delivered you wins against the teams that... England, well, Australia. England. He's delivered yeah. you a team that makes everyone happy in Scotland against England. His record against England again. is extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, let's hope he works his way back in because actually I think Scotland are... Well, that's hopefully, hopefully there's a reason that they're choosing not to share with us because we don't need to know. Yes, and maybe Possibly maybe it's some so. master stroke that he needs to rest and focus yeah. on, you know, focus on his French rugby. He's got a, he's got to pick up a new Ferrari next week. Maybe. So yeah. Quick word. Oh, and Michael Hooper back for the Wallabies as well. Phenomenal talent. Had a bit of a timeout. Reboot, recharge, much needed. Do you ever know what happened with that? You know, but I think that's a you know what we talked about earlier. That's a good thing. That yeah, they recognised it and they said, right, okay, if you need that time, you get that. Well, time. I think he, he, think he did as he well, which is really it, yeah. more mark of a man to put your hand up and say, I, not in a not in a good place. I think yeah. that's really commendable. Fair play. One other lunch, Japan against New Zealand. It couldn't, could it? I don't know, could it? There will never oh, be a better God. time if that happened. Not, I know. Uh, what would they do? Uh, <laughs> what would they? What would the they actually do? You, you would just see. You would just see the next day. Apparently, New Zealand's disappeared. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Imagine Control they just, delete in Auckland. Yeah. That's it. Just just Jacinda just went like, oh, yeah. fuck's sake. <laughs> Key open. Boop. Boom. Gone. That's fine. Yeah, that'll be it. Just the end of it. Like, I, I don't, don't know what to do. But it would be every could. time Jamie a Kiwi. There's still a silver cloud. Just, yeah. It's not over any land like, anymore. Every time a Kiwi, though, ever spoke about anything, it's like, oh, yeah, nah, nah. You'd be like, fuck, you lost to <laughs> Japan. Just shut your mouth. <laughs> that would be the... that. But I it's never going to happen. They're too good. They're too good. I think... The very fact that we're even tempting it or even joking about it, you know, they, they're they too good. New Zealand, you know, Ardy Severe, all the boys, they're just way, way too good. And I think they're actually going to be on a path back. And I wouldn't be surprised if they don't go on and win the World Cup, if I'm honest yeah. with you. I think it'll be a good game. I, I, I think Japan generally being the best out of people because they just don't kick the ball out. Yeah. They, they play in play. You've got to, you know, it comes down to skill sets. They push France quite close in the in the summer. Um why not? But yeah. but if they but, but, if, but if, if 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 they do, it's well worth having that one on over your cornflakes on Saturday morning, ten to seven, um, because if, <laughs> yeah, if you're going to want to be there, Christopher Robshaw, valet. Yes, very sad. Message and said, "Well done, hell of a knock." He's come back and said, "Thanks very much." Could you put something into my new foundation auction trust, please? Is that what he said? Yes, Christopher. Uh, the 
Curse Lake Robshaw Foundation is now up and running. Have a little look at that. I, I am very pleased to him that he gets the, the farewell that he deserves because it shouldn't just be about what happened seven years ago. There was a hell of a lot to that career and a lot of it in the face of some pretty bumpy times. Look, I think he was a is a brilliant person, a brilliant player. I was lucky to to play. I think certainly under nineteens, on twenty ones with him. Um, you know, we spent hours after training practicing together, all, well, all the way through. You know, in two thousand eleven, um, he was building up to that tournament was the best player, and they just didn't pick him. He should have gone to the World Cup. Um, obviously, then capitalised on kind of that that disappointment, got into the England side. Obviously, was captain of the of the team. Was I don't think got dropped. For, for, for a game played a number of continuous games I'd love to see how many games he actually played back to back um, you know the World Cup stuff I, I said before you know, he, he, I, he wasn't his fault he was stitched up um, no one wanted to take the kick no one came down from the sidelines to say anything to make the kick and everything else that and he made a decision on what was in front of him and it wasn't the right decision ultimately but um, you know he, he went with it and I think he was hung out to dry and I don't think anyone stood up for him and, and you know that's that's the shame but I don't think that's got anything to do with his his career I think he's a brilliant guy I think obviously this, you know Curse Lake Robshaw Foundation should be brilliant I mean I th I imagine if, if you don't donate Camilla comes around and just sings in your face which is enough to make you put any money into into it um, but yeah look I think he's a lovely guy as well and I'm, I'm, I'm sad that he didn't get to to maybe finish over here because the San Diego journey I think was an amazing chapter yeah. and maybe could have got something else but actually unfortunately we've talked about this a million times you very rarely get to choose the way you go out but he'll be fondly remembered by everybody that he he played with I don't think anyone's got a bad word to say about Robbo um, he was a great player and some of the performances he put in for England were, were next level I love him and you know, you know, you know England player England player why do you build me up <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, sort of a mark of the man that he never really came out. He's never really come out and tried to have a go back and, and say it. I think, you know, that's the type of person he was on the field. You know, a bit Richard Hilly sometimes. In, in fact, that he just gets on. He yeah. doesn't really, uh, he doesn't crave adoration or anything. He just gets on with his job. And, you know, for three or four of those seasons, his energy, like his you know, his ability to get around the field, and he was just everywhere mm. and uh, and did all that all the dog work that, you know, when you have your combinations right, other people pick up the other bits. And um, yeah, I know. I think it's it, as has said. You never get the the right way to go out. But uh, I don't think. I think he's got a very firm place in the in the history books of of English rugby. Sixty six caps, forty three as skipper, wins over the All Blacks, South Africa, Australia, and he also Grand stitched Slam him up at a dinner. So yeah, it's you are. I never forget. Um, sure. He did. Yeah. I think I can't remember I've told it so I won't tell it now but uh, yeah Robert got his revenge uh, you know revenge is a dish best served cold and Robert waited five years six <laughs> years to do me in the eye and and um, I, you know I can still remember the evils that Stuart Lancaster and Andy Farrell gave me like don't do it I was like sorry been called up by the lads um, I will tell you one thing about Robert one of the most moving things I ever saw was um, under Eddie Jones um, his, I think our game where we played against uh, Wales at Twickenham and to beat them he kind of buried that demon and him to see him in his locker crying and kind of that emotional, uncontrollable emotion coming out of him, you know, because he didn't say anything about anything. He didn't complain and he just sucked it all up and he, you know, dealt with pretty horrific press and there are some toxic people in the rugby world. You know, some of the people that are um, narrators and commentators in, in rugby and some of these people with YouTube channels and people who are lauded, they've got a very short memory that they're very, very, very toxic people and they pretty much you know, tried to destroy him. And to watch all that emotion come out and just kind of emotionally exhaustion was was amazing to see. And to, you know, and basically said he, in his words, he did it. He did it. He buried that demon, beat Wales at the Twickenham. We went on to, you know, went on to to, to win that that Grand Slam and buried that hatchet and, and actually came back and played some of the best rugby he ever played. It was a shame that he didn't end up going to the to the World Cup in the end. Mm. But but you know, hit my hit himself, Dylan, guys like me. We all served a purpose in doing our role to make that team better and that's that's all you can ask for you did your bit and he certainly did his bit as well well done Robbo good innings we will finish with Mike's magic moment of the week magic Mike's moment of the week those are two very different things I think <laughs> once for Friday night <laughs> once for a Monday the magic yep. moment of the week Mike well basically oh, well. this is hopefully another way that we are going to interact uh, so you can share some magic moments that have happened at your local rugby club uh, at the same time. Um, but it is also to prove that actually one of us does still watch rugby every now and again. Um, so we'll always, we'll search the games from all leagues, but please share as well if I might miss something, because that can happen. And um, we'll also take cross codes, I reckon, because we, we could be one rugby. We might yes. do something on that at some point. We should do that. Um, so I've, I've brought us a few uh, possibilities to talk about. Right. 
he's probably not seen them, but you know, we'll I talk have. about them. Yep. But one of them he definitely did see. My first one, so we'll start earliest in the week, was Thursday night. A certain good, the bad, the rugby employer. Employee. employee. <laughs> yeah. Better not be an you employer. Better not be an employer. Like, <laughs> fucking sack Shit's me. gone wrong if he is. Yeah. It's Tommy. Tommy Hothstall came on for your team. Hot stepper. Oh my God. Do you know what got me about all of it? Was his defence. Because normally, if you're of a smaller stature and you've got wheels, defending can be optional. Mate, he was sickling people at the ankles. He tried to did a mega try saving tackle on Dylan. Yeah. Yeah. Did, you, did you not figure that out when he was dressed as a, what was he dressed? A lobster. a lobster. and slid down a thing and ripped his ear off. And he was still in. I'm quite impressed. He was still in work. You were obviously on, but when he went up, so he's, he's I think, 11 stitches in yeah. his ear. And as he was running on, he was like, oh, hang on, I better get that taped up. So he literally, a bit right like, sort of, yeah, gaffer put, tape put the, the 19, ear back on his head. the 1980s tape yeah. on and went, got on the wing and got stuck Loved in. It. So uh, one of his tries where he, he must have stepped at least seven people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, then, he then stepped a shadow of someone else and they fell over as well um, and to score. So Tommy was up there is my one. Um, I've put in Marcus Smith's try on the weekend. Yep. How rugby should be done. Clinical, fast-paced, angles at, angles everywhere and clinical as yep. you like. It's amazing he actually made it over the line with the amount of deals he signed this week. The amount <laughs> of cash in his pockets must have been weighing him down. If you follow What's his he signed? Uh, Charles Tirrett shirts, Optimum Nutrition, Lucas Aid Sport, and Nike recently. I mean, he's got more deals than Tesco's. So I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> but he's still agile and mobile, so obviously he's just dealing with credit cards only. No Bitcoin. cash. Yeah, Bitcoin. Straight, yeah. straight, straight bank transfers. Um, then my other one was uh, Hastings. His drop, drop goal. goal for Gloucester. Um, he hit two in warm up, and then someone, the trainer said, "Don't hit another one. Don't waste it. Just save it for the game." And then he hit a fifty-six yarder, snuck over there. Gloucester went on to win. Ended up being the winning kick. But um, so yeah, that was a highlight. Maybe because it's Gloucester one. But I think my winner. Is, oh, I've got a shout out to Rosie Galligan as well. Second yeah. row scoring a hat trick. Yeah, that scored four, but could have had four. One, you know, Should have had got, four. One got pulled back. Yeah, um, uh, an impressive personal performance, but. My, you can argue with me, was Alex Goode. Yeah. 338 games for Saracens equals the most amount of appearances. Hasn't hit a shot at goal all season. Has one to win in the 81st minute. Not an easy kick. 50, 50 out on an angle. Nothing but net. Straight through the middle. Doesn't celebrate, just turns around and walks off. So he didn't celebrate, but but sort of put the hand up very, very quick. I love it when goal kickers know the moment that's left the tee. I was watching one of when I, I found it quite funny. It was Scotland versus Italy and Duncan Weir hit one from 40. And as soon as he hit the butt, he's turned around celebrating. I, I saw like, that highlight, yeah. I was like, that is, to hit it, turn around and celebrate. Yeah. And then after he's run back about seven metres, he turns around just to check it, it see it's I? gone yeah. over. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, celebrating mutely there was there was quite a um quite an interesting point about that around the booing so obviously you go to Thom Thoman Park in Limerick and it's absolutely deadpan when opposition goal kickers go but there was quite a lot of booing and the people were saying I don't quite get the problem with booing and why, why has rugby got such a problem with booing it's like atmospheric you go to a Premier League football ground and you get people booing and hissing and a bottle it, your I, head. I think yeah. it's, it's one or the other isn't it you either got to be all in yeah, and it's a free for all because yeah. then that doesn't really get into your brain. It's someone who does it like yeah. a golfer. Yeah, you can play golf shots if the noise is there constantly. It's then if some just yes, one ran, in your back swing. Yes, yeah, like boo, 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 boo. Yeah. You're like, fuck <laughs> off, you idiots. It's because they got you know. I would, I, do, I wouldn't care. I don't want a cauldron. I want them to like rude songs. I want everything. I mean, football atmospheres are so good. I mean, yeah. I would probably draw the line at the sea bomb because you don't want kids picking up. But a few, you know, a few yeah. funny songs I think were quite good. Instead of like swing low, sweet. Yeah. It's like well, that's racist. Can't do that now. So this we've got nothing. No. Just, bravo, bravo. Edit. Uh, that's I not, think... It's true. It, it, it <laughs> right, is true. Did, yeah, we, did we ascertain right. it wasn't racist in, or it is racist now? I think there was an inquiry. Well, we to... in this day and age, they're clearing. That's if what it, I mean. Well, doubt, that's we've, li we've literally got no song. There's no song anymore. What other rugby song do you sing at this song? Land you know? of Hope and Glory. Or that Tiggy Tiggy Tonga that they all, you know, like, that's bollocks. That's awful. <laughs> there's nothing. There's um, nothing now. There's honestly nothing to do at rugby game. Who's going to win the Premiership? <laughs> your <laughs> shit. Segway. And you know you are. Shut up. Segway. Uh, who is going to win the Premiership? Saris. Saris, <laughs> yeah. Do you think Saris? Yeah, I think so. We will leave it there. We have been the good, the bad, and the rugby. We will see you next week. Some of us will see you next week. Some of us won't.
Good luck if you're not here next week. Yeah, Good luck if you, if you are. Yeah. The show is produced by Shara Kilgallen and Ollie Hunter, the Good, the Bad and the Rugby is a folding pocket production. Adios.